Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar organized by School Education Gateway. This is the first time we meet after the summer break and I hope you uh, all manage to rest a bit and spend some good time. My name is Marta and I'm pleased to host this event today. Uh, today's focus is language learning in school, interdisciplinarity and creative writing. So um, I'm really happy to um, introduce you Anna Felican, Policy Officer at the European Commission in Erasmus Plus program team for school education, vocational education and training and adult learning sectors, and Loredana Popa, e twinning and scientist ambassador. But without further delay, I would like to give you the floor, Oana. Thank you for being here today. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. I'm really delighted to, to join you today for uh, this, this webinar on language learning. Um, to introduce you to, to our webinar today and place it into the wider context, uh, I am pleased to share with you a short overview of the European policy in the field of language learning and teaching and how the Erasmus Plus program supports it. It is fair to say that education begins with language. Language learning and teaching is very much at the heart of our current policy priorities. One of the objectives set by our European leaders in their vision for a European education area was to overcome the remaining barriers to the free movement of learners. One of these barriers is none other than the lack of foreign language proficiency. Implementing the three language strategy, that is, the language of schooling plus two more will enable learners to achieve higher competence levels. This is a fundamental first step toward overcoming these barriers. The strategy I'm mentioning is set out in the Council recommendation on a comprehensive approach to the teaching and learning of languages that was adopted by the EU ministers of all member states in May 2019. Now, coming back to the strategy more concretely, it means, first of all, lit literacy is the basis for all fur further learning. So we need to assure that every student reaches an excellent level in the language of schooling. When speaking about the language of schooling, one cannot ignore the reality in the fields, in the schools in Europe, which are becoming more and more multilingual with one in 10 15 year old pupils, pupils speaking a different language at home than at school. So supporting acquisition of the language of schooling while, while at the same time valuing, valuing linguistic diversity is a matter of social justice and inclusion. Language awareness is a key concept that is set out in the Council recommendation of, on languages to help teachers, learners and the wider school community to cope with this increased diversity in schools. Secondly, we need to raise the bar um, of foreign, first foreign language to make sure that a very good level is reached in this first foreign language. In most uh, member states, pupils start learning the first foreign language in primary school. This means that they have between seven and 10 years of learning this before uh, they leave school. And I think we all agree that such an investment should lead to a result, allowing students to actually use this language to study or to work. And then third point, it's very important that we encourage learners to learn an additional uh, third language in school. Now, if you would like to go more in depth on, on, um, uh, on um, uh, this, uh, this recommendation, I recommend you the Education Begins with Language report that captures the, the key issues set in this Council recommendation, together with some rich examples on, on the work achieved by the member states. It's a quite reader friendly uh, report, so don't be scared, it, it is also very short. Now, the underlying question of all this is how? How can we reach higher competence level? One element of response is that language learning is not a task for the language teachers only, nor for language classes only. Integrated languages into other subjects 
or into other parts of the school life can provide more authentic learning, learning in real life situations. And this is precisely what we are going to discover today with the help of Loredana and her, uh, her um, uh, very interesting project. I would like now to briefly highlight. Oh, how I'm sorry if I interrupt you. I remind you, you can also take control of the slides. So you'll be able to change them by yourself. Ah, because I change them. So in my view. OK, perfect. OK, so now uh, you can see the second slide where yeah, the education exactly. begins with a language report. And yeah. uh, on the slide, there is also the link to access this report. And uh, I'm also asking, please, uh, Marta uh, and Eleonora, if you can place it in, in the chat also. Uh, now a short point on uh, how Erasmus Plus program supports uh, these objectives. We, are, we have recently started the new uh, programming period for 2021-2027, where we have almost doubled the amount of money available for, for Erasmus up to uh, 26 billion euro for the next seven years. Language learning is a fundamental feature of Erasmus Plus. It is supported through mobility, cooperation projects, and co collaborative platforms for teachers such as eTwinning that you, most of you know very well. From this year on, also pupils from general school education can fully benefit from Erasmus Plus and go abroad individually or with their class, in addition to vocational education and training learners. This will highly contribute to boosting their language learning skills. And we have put in place, the, the program has put in place specific language learning supporting mechanism for particular target groups in schools and vocational education that need it the most. In addition to mobility, supporting comprehensive approaches to the teaching and learning of languages is part of the priorities for partnership for cooperation in the school education field. Valorization tools such as the European language label are also being reinforced by uh, building, um, strengthening the links with Erasmus Plus ecosystem. Before I conclude, and I let you enjoy the, the webinar, two, two things I would like to, to, to request for you. You remember in the beginning, I have mentioned the, the necessity of valuing uh, linguistic diversity in classrooms as a as a basis for further learning and acquire acquisition of the language of schooling we are currently working on a new recommendation entitled pathways to school success which aims to reinforce uh, action to tackle underachievement early school leaving while promoting well-being and school success for all a public, an open public consultation runs until the 30th of September. Please get involved. We need your voices to participate as a teacher, as a school representative, as a school leader, a school authority, as a parent, as a citizen. It takes no more than 50 minutes to fill in this survey. It is available in all EU, EU languages and the link is in the slide and also available on the chat. And before I conclude, uh, we are in September and September is the month where we celebrate languages. And therefore, I would like to invite us to join us on the 27th of September for our online conference, a conference um, around language competencies in the European education area. It will take place online on the 27th of September from 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock. No registration needed, just follow uh, the event uh, via the event website or via uh, Erasmus Plus uh, social media account, so Facebook and Twitter. Thank you very much. And now I have the pleasure to pass the floor to Loredana. Thank you very much, uh, Oana, for the extensive, extensive presentation and uh, useful resources you provided. We invite you to join the event uh, you just mentioned, of course. And now, yes, I would like to pass the floor to Loredana. Welcome, Loredana. Thank you. Uh, are you going to switch the presentations? Yes. So I can take control? OK. It's loading. You. OK, perfect. Uh, OK, I'll just press take control. OK. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm an English teacher first and foremost, so forget the ambassador part. 
uh, it was just there to uh, show that I um, I absolutely love both science and languages. Uh, so I really try to combine them uh, whenever I can. And today I want to talk to you about uh, how you could learn English through STEM subjects and also creative writing, because when we look at, when we hear STEM and creative writing put together, it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but it is really not. It is really a, a blend made in heaven. So um, without further ado, let's go to something that sounds a bit like a bad commercial. You know, when they uh, start with a couple of questions and then, you know, drum roll and they give you a magical solution. Well, it's not really like that, but um, we've all been there with our students struggling to grasp, to understand STEM concepts. And sometimes we don't know why. Is it our own teaching? Is it because they really don't like STEM? Is it because they cannot understand it? And it's not actually that most of the time. It's just that they don't see the point. I've had students tell me, what's the point of learning this in physics, chemistry, biology? I can just Google any problem I want and I'll find somebody who can answer for me. Uh, and I don't have to think because there's always there, there will always be Google. And I try to tell them, what if there is a blackout, a worldwide blackout tomorrow? What if you are stranded somewhere and you have to rely just on your wits and your creative thinking? Uh, another reason, another problem we've uh, we've all come across is as language teachers, students who really don't like to to write because they hate grammar and they uh, prefer to avoid the writing tasks as often as they can, unless it's Google Translate or if it's Wikipedia or if they have an older brother or something, uh, because they don't see the point again. Why do I have to write about this? I don't care about it. And um, what they most often say is that um, they don't need to know all the grammar rules. They're not gonna use them in life. And that's quite true because Quite frankly, you need to be understood. You need to make yourself understa understood. It doesn't have to be perfect English. It doesn't have to be perfect grammar. Uh, you just have to, you know, um, get your ideas across. And in schools, we should encourage students to make mistakes and they should get that mindset that it is quite all right to make them because it's a stepping stone. They learn from them and they grow um, and they should not be afraid to say when they don't understand something. So why creative writing? Um, well, basically because it's a lot of fun and also because it makes the experience more memorable. So whatever they are writing about will stick in their heads um, and because it allows them to think outside the box and find solutions uh, to problems they may not have uh, you know, solved otherwise. And because it helps connect both hemispheres and that's something that, again, school doesn't do often enough. And because when they explain STEM concepts as a story, it makes it so much easier for them to understand it because they're explaining it in a creative way and for their colleagues to understand it. Um, I had a history teacher in high school. He used to make it all about stories. I don't remember reading a single lesson at home but I can still remember most of what he told me because everything was a story and it, you know, it just took you somewhere else. It helped you visualize whatever he was saying. Um, and that's what we should do with our students. We should make um, the science um, of it as a story because there's a, a really nice quote from Doctor Who, again, like I said, a, a science fiction fan that says, we're all stories in the end. Let's just make it a good one. But what do we do when we have traditional teaching, but interdisciplinary exams, like PISA, for example? In Romania, um, school subjects are taught individually, most cases, and they're not connected. They're not taught in an interconnected way as they should. And that's uh, really not the way life works. And we all know that. And eighth graders, for example, have interdisciplinary um, exams at the end, um, before they go to high school and they are not taught that way. They get a problem they have to solve and they need geography and physics and maths for it. And they are used to uh, approach that, um, to approach school subjects individually. And they are a bit confused. They don't understand where that is coming from because uh, a lot of the times uh, students um, are not told 
what learning this particular formula or um, I don't know uh, laws uh, will help them, how that will help them in life. They're not given specific examples, so they don't. Their brain doesn't consider that information relevant because it does not see the applicability of it. Uh, and they also, uh, and and they also um, are unprepared for real life situations because they will not know how to approach a problem if it's not something they've memorized or you know something standard that they've done before. If it's something that surprises them, they won't know how to make he how to make heads or tails of it. So why don't we change? And feel free to put that in the uh, put your answers in the chat. Uh, based on your educational expertise and the realities in your countries, um, sometimes it is difficult because there is not enough time. You know, doing it in an interdisciplinary way, teaching it like that, takes a lot of time at first and a bit of time also, um, even when you get more experienced. Uh, it takes time planning and you have to adjust. And you have to have that particular mindset that probably things will go wrong, but it's quite okay because if they do go wrong, it means an opportunity to, for you and your students to learn something more and to grow more on a personal level. Because again, that is something that we are not focusing enough. Students need to grow on a personal level as well. So what happened if we uh, did change? and approached school subjects and teaching in an interdisciplinary way, we would have specialists, we would have students that would know their, we would have students that would be versed in scientific terminology. I have students who love mechanics, but nothing else. And the only thing that worked with them was um, asking my students, what specific vocabulary do you need? What do you think is useful for you in life? based on your interests. So we had medical terminology, we had, uh, we had mechanics, we had at some point, I think, even quantum physics, because one of the students was interested in that. We talked about uh, quasars, we talked about cars of the future, about nanotechnology, anything they want, because it will get them motivated to learn the vocabulary, to uh, be more interested in reading in English or in any foreign language, and to actually understand. It's about understanding what they're reading as much as it as much as it is about understanding, um, learning the terminology. So could languages really be learned through STEM? Of course they could, because um, anything can be learned through STEM, right? As an advice, as a piece of advice, how do we get students from I cannot do this or understand this for the life of me to I'm really interested, I want to pitch in? And the key is let them know that they are essential, that their voice matters, um, that their opinion matters, and that their needs come first. That they, that you are there to help them and to guide them. You're not there to judge them and correct them, and you know um, make them feel ashamed of their mistakes. Uh, you are there to learn them how to ask for help and where to ask for help. Uh, and uh, like I put there in the bottom, um, problems will never come and tap you on the shoulder and say, I'm a geography problem. You only need geography to solve me in life. Um, again, they go into a different country and they will not, um, you know, they will not run into somebody tapping them on the shoulder and say, what's the present perfect? What's the third conditional? Um, they will need to know how to ask for specific information how to understand specific information. Um, and that's something that students should be aware of because right now they're still um, developing, their brains are still developing and they, are, they rely on the exams a lot and what they are requested and what they need to know for exams. And that's not always relevant for what they need in life, unfortunately. So can we put all of these school subjects into a story? Uh, I will give you some ideas and um, some ideas, some uh, things that I've tested and I've had lots of fun with and my students have had lots of fun with. Um, so the secret, well, recipe, not a secret. The first one, you can read the instructions. I'm not going to do that. But what I want to point out is that you should encourage your students to do the research. 
um, because uh, oftentimes when we ask them to present a scientist, a personality, a place, an event, um, a chemical reaction, whatever you want, when we ask them to present anything, their first inst instinct is to go to Wikipedia and copy paste. And uh, they don't synthesize the information, they don't digest it, they don't fully understand it. Um, and without fully understanding something, they cannot, that cannot be committed to long term memory. And it is not something that can uh, be useful later on in life. So encourage your students to do research on their character, on their um, event or cultural heritage site, whatever you choose to put um, to use for that um, story uh, or the urban legend, and make sure they have access to proper vocabulary. If it means contacting um, a specialist or a fellow or a colleague at school, uh, if you're not comfortable with um, science terminology, um, then it's really, really nice to ask um, a teacher to assist you. Um, and that way students see that it is quite okay. Yes, you will be given the PowerPoints. Uh, and the students see that it is um, really nice to work together as teachers. And it is really nice to rely on each other. And that we don't have that ego that I'm uh, way above you. So it's, it's not a healthy attitude. And that's one of the reasons sometimes that um, teachers don't go for the interdisciplinary way. Um, because it, somehow it means that they have to learn from students. And I've had that said to my face. Um, but it happens really rarely. Most teachers really love learning from their students. So background matters when it comes to your character because they need to um, really understand what that particular personality did, what they discovered, um, how that can be applied uh, in life or how that can uh, relate to their experience, for example, if it's possible. And um, obviously, you can, they can write the stories on a piece of paper. They can write them online. Um, they can do improv and they can just um, do it orally, whatever you choose. But give them access to resources for the vocabulary and resources for the, res for the research. Um, another um, idea um, comes from a project, Learning Differently. Uh, and uh, I just got the news um, about two maybe two hours ago, uh, the unofficial news that it got the European language label this year. And this project was actually focused on improving PISA results for students, improving literacy and improving their skills in reading, writing, uh, speaking, but for all school subjects. So we wanted our students to be able to understand physics texts and chemistry texts and biology. Um, and we wanted language, uh, English uh, in our case, uh, to be combined with STEM. So they get uh, the best of both worlds. So one idea is a creative writing kit. And um, at the bottom here, you have the link to the twin space. Uh, if you will, uh, if you want to go and uh, check it out and you will find um, a really nice publication about 100 pages of methods and tools that we designed. Um, and how this works is we create, we use this um, very nice website to create trading cards. And we created trading cards for personalities, places, and recipes. And some students created uh, trading cards for gadgets or for inventions or for historical events. It's up to you. Um, and what they do is they draw a card from each category and they have to make up a story. Well, it's Obviously, it's a lot more fun uh, when the personality is from Poland, the place is in Romania, and the recipe is from Lithuania and the gadget or historical event has absolutely nothing to do with the personality. Um, what they do need is, again, research. They need to understand, and you need to support them with that. And when they write their story, you can actually check their level of understanding, both of the you know, um, vocabulary and also of the actual facts. Uh, and it encourages them to um, ask questions for example, you have a story that starts with Copernicus was eating pizza uh, in the middle of the afternoon. And, you know, your first instinct was, why was Copernicus eating pizza? Was pizza even invented back then? Where was he? 
Why doesn't the author say, how did he get there? Um, was he alone? Was he speaking the language? Did he have the adequate money? And so on. Um, and the first draft that the students write is usually uh, quite simple. I've done this with fifth graders. And um, the fun part is when they start asking questions and enriching the stories and making sure the authors explain everything in that story. It gets them to actually think a lot deeper. So the more questions you have, the more memorable the story becomes uh, and the, the crazier the story becomes. And we all know that we always remember the things that shock us, the things, the things that sound completely impossible, but they, stick, but they stick with us. So this is what the trading cards look like. This is where you can download it from. Um, it's a Google Drive link because the document is so big that it could not be uploaded to Jumag or Calameo or any other platform. I've tried. Um, if I manage to find an alternative or if you have an idea, it's over 300 megabytes. Um, I will upload it and put the link in the twin space. You can print them and you can cut them. If you don't want to print them, that's OK. You can just create a wheel decide or a word wall game. And you can just write the names and then um, draw a random a random name from each category for every group, uh, whatever suits you. Uh, the the kit at this point has um, over 120 cards, but we are still adding new cards every year because all the students want to create new cards and they want to pick new countries. And um, what I love about this is that um, it helps the students synthesize the information. They don't have the luxury of copy pasting from Wikipedia, the entire article. They have to write two, three sentences and that's it. And they have to find the relevant information. Um, and um, I said I was going to share just a couple of uh, stories. Obviously, we're not going to read them uh, just so you can get an impression. Uh, it's about Nikolai Yorga, who is a Romanian historian and uh, an electric car. Now, the first sentence is quite insane because when you read that, you're going to say, where did he have the knowledge? How did he know how to build an electric car? Why did he want to travel in time? These are questions that are not answered in this um, draft of the story. Did he travel to the future, to the past? Was there an important event there? And it gets your, your students thinking they have to come up with the answers and the answers have to make sense. Um, and he wanted to visit an old Bulgarian town, Plovdiv. Why? What's the history of the place? Um, can you describe the architecture? And again, we go into specific vocabulary. Um, and I will not go through the entire story, but there is a sentence there I like and that sparks a lot of discussion. Um, they say that he saw a big family having dinner and that family invited him for dinner. Now, do you actually invite strangers into your house? You see them looking outside your window and you say, well, come on in and have dinner with us. Is it safe? And you can have an entire conversation about safety, e-safety, about talking to strangers, about what is socially acceptable, what isn't. Maybe the family knew him, maybe they recognized him. Uh, there are a lot of ideas that can um, come from this. And a lot of ways that students can enrich a story. The point is to make them think, because that's what we don't do enough. We don't get them to think. Um, and this one is very short. It's about a Romanian scientist who could not have been watching Friends, different time zones, um, different time periods. And he was Dracula's brother. Again, different time periods. So. This story can be enriched in lots of different ways. Uh, you can turn it into uh, go back in time and meet my brother from another dimension kind of um, you know, story. Or you can go with he was having a dream or a nightmare. You can go with whatever you want as long as you um, keep the details realistic. You, you cannot say that uh, Prokopiu was discussing, I don't know, um, uh, I'm I'm lost for words. I don't know chemical reactions or um, with his um, you know Dracula brother. And these are my fifth graders. Some of them working with the trading cards. Uh, we decided to print them. It was easier. 
obviously nowadays um, we can't do that anymore, uh, but we are trying to find an alternative. Another idea from the same project is climate change and real life issues, because uh, they tend to get their news from social media. And we want them to be informed about uh, what's going on um, today. And we want to, them to be comfortable reading articles and reading maybe um, scientific articles, if they're a bit older, in a foreign language. And for that, again, they need terminology. So um, what they do is they write from a different perspective. And the ideas were given by the students, most of them. Uh, and you will see some of them. They write uh, from the perspective of a forest where all the trees have been cut down um, or the ocean dying from pollution or an animal that's in pain because it's been tested on for cosmetics or an animal in a circus or a doctor in a war zone or a child that is bullied or a lonely person or this is my favorite, the Earth's conscious, uh, consciousness and uh, there are a lot more. And you can do this thing with your students. You can get the ideas from your students. And it works really well for shy students, for students who don't want to um, talk about their problems, because uh, they will end up talking about their feelings and their problems. But they're going to hide behind that character. They're going to say, it's not me. I'm not the one feeling that way. It's that character. So I'm not actually showing you how I feel. And honestly, as long as it helps them process whatever emotions they have and also learn um, a foreign language and a thing or two about other school subjects, uh, then it's a win-win for me. Um, let's go with something else, science or science fiction, one of my favorite activities. I think uh, many of you have done that. We pick a random film, science fiction film. This is an example from The Martian. Um, but we've done Doctor Who, we've done Star Wars, Star Trek, um, and I don't know, um, we've done something else, but I can't remember right now. Um, and we analyze the science in it. So students have to analyze the science in a particular key scene. Uh, again, uh, my advice, talk to a colleague if you don't, um, if you're not comfortable with STEM or actually a uh, consult a specialist um, because, uh, you know, it could be a, a neat winner. It could be another teacher from a different country. Um, so the students have to analyze the science. And if the science is wrong, they have to correct it. Um, and if the science is and rewrite the story. Um, and if the science is correct, then they have to explain it in a creative way. It can be a song, a poem, a comic strip, whatever they choose, as long as it's creative and it's fun and it's memorable. Um, but when you do this um, type of exercise, when you choose a film, um, you can choose uh, according to the level you're teaching. So if you are in primary, um, you can choose um, a short story and go with the science. We had a very lovely A twinning project, science fairy, uh, science and fairy tales. Um, it was the ugly duckling. So you you can talk about reflection, and you can they can learn a bit of terminology about physics, you know, basic words or basic concepts. But it will spark their interest in science. And we need more students to be interested in science, and more students to understand that science and languages um, are connected and that our brain doesn't separate these two. We don't just think about science and think about language. It's all in there, connected. Another thing, this is not quite creative writing, but something that your students will definitely love is interdisciplinary treasure hunts. And we take uh, questions from everything they're studying at school in that particular semester. Um, they write them in English, so they have to do research about um, terminology in physics, in chemistry, biology. They had the nervous system. They had uh, noble gases. Um, they can write short quizzes um, or short riddles. Um, and we uh, transfer them uh, into QR codes and we place them in the school. And they, you know, try to uh, collect all the clues 
and to solve the um, the treasure hunt. And this really works well when the students are those creating the content. These are some of the examples. I haven't checked them in a long time. I have lots of um, treasure hunts like this, but I think you have history and you have um, uh, you also have uh, English grammar in there somewhere, or chemistry as well. Um, something else that you might like, and this is actually the last idea um, from my presentation before we go to the Q&A. Um, it's uh, maths, but it can be any other concept, any other school subject, and comic strips. I was telling you about uh, applicability of um, STEM concepts. Uh, something they learn in school, but they don't know how they will actually use in life. And um, in this, in our project in learning differently, the partners from Croatia um, used uh, comic strips to explain Pythagorean theorem. I'm looking forward. Actually, I um, it was an idea that they gave us um, at the end of May. There was no time for us to test it out, but we're actually looking forward to testing it out this year. And I can give you some examples. They are in Croatian, so I'm sorry, but you can understand from the drawings. Uh, they found various ways of explaining the theorem and um, trying to uh, show the colleagues how that particular concept applies in real life and why they need to learn that. And before we, um, before we finish and go on to the questions, um, I just want to say that um, languages, um, learning more than one language is um, an incredible way for our brain to develop because uh, the brain of a person who speaks more than one language, it doesn't have to be fluent, you know, is um, more active, is different. It is um, something that helps us process information faster, create connections, understand things better, maybe see the bigger picture. So when your students um, don't know why they should be learning a foreign language, um, ask them to um, give you a situation where they would need a particular foreign language, a field where they would need that language, and insist on that. And Erasmus really offers a great opportunity um, because they um, get in contact with students from other countries, and it makes the experience a lot more relevant and a lot more real for them. Um, and it also has context. They will be in a different country and they will be in a completely different setting than they have no control over at that point. And they will have to rely on themselves and on the friends they make there and on their way of uh, learning and adjusting to situations. And um, interdisciplinarity is does that, help them adjust and become flexible and become able to solve problems and to see solutions uh, where other people may not. Thank you for the... Uh, Thank you for your time. I don't know if I went overboard um, or if we have enough time for Q&A. We are perfectly on time, Loredana. Thank you okay. very much for the presentation. So, thank and yes, you. Yes. Thank definitely you for the, we, we have time for question here. and answer. I haven't seen questions in the chat, but I encourage the participants to post them now because I think it's a really good opportunity. I know you and Oana, you both were really clear, but... <laughs> Still, I think it's a, it's an opportunity for the for the participants. So I I invite you all to post your questions in the chat. Meanwhile, uh, I would like to remind you that we have a feedback form. So we would like also you to complete the feedback form. We'll post the link in the chat in a while, and you can save it and do it later. Um, I see a lot of positive comments uh, in the chat. And yes, please, Juana, go ahead. I... Yes, just I wanted to, to say it was a real pleasure hearing <laughs> hearing Loredana. <laughs> in parallel, I was also discussing with, uh, with a colleague how we can promote this project further on because it's really, it's really inspiring. It goes far, far beyond language learning and uh, and all these approaches you had uh, interdisciplinary it's, it's really at the heart of the whole uh, school approach that is being uh, promoted uh, by the european commission and um, i remind you again please fill in the survey to the pathways to school success 
because this is what it is about also. So it's available in all languages. And, and really, it was a, a real pleasure hearing, hearing this project and all the Dana. And here we have a, a question for um, uh, for Loredana, I think. So for the trouser hands, even in the stem, we can use flip it as after a presentation. This can be used in a flip le learning as well. Yes, obviously, this can be used in flip learning because they do all the research and they do all the creation um, at home uh, and you're just as a guide. Um, for them, if you want to, um, I haven't used Flippity a lot. I know what it is. I haven't used it a lot. Um, but flipped learning is really uh, something that we should um, try in school. Again, it takes planning. And I don't know, maybe we need to show our uh, colleagues uh, how to better plan to try this approach and how to um, integrate it into the curriculum. That's the big problem we have. Because oftentimes in Romania, they will say, I don't have time to teach my curriculum and also do this because it's a bit of extra and I don't have the physical time. So maybe we can help with this, um, you know, maybe uh, showcasing ideas and how to integrate into the curriculum and how to actually um, make planning easier and evaluation. Because again, they will say, OK, but how do you evaluate? Um, when you have a group of students working on something and do you evaluate their biology knowledge and their chemistry on or just their English? And what you evaluate is actually their problem solving technique and their creative thinking and their research uh, technique. And for this, you can use grids that you can that you should really develop with your students because they have to agree. And they have to see that their voice matters in how they are evaluated as well. Thank you, Loredana, for replying. And uh, Diana is also saying that, that everything you mentioned can be used with mixed ability groups. Yes, all my classes are mixed ability. I mean, I have some classes where there is a huge gap between low level and very high level in terms of English competencies. Um, but this kind of, uh, you know, gives them a chance to be on, e on an equal plane because everybody has a strength that we can play to. And you can have a student who's really good at maths, but really struggles with English because they struggle with pronunciation. They struggle with vocabulary, uh, but they don't struggle with the science. So you can put them together and um, you have students who are really good at researching information or have digital skills that are, you know, really uh, exquisite and uh, they can help the others, even though they don't have really good grades, because in school, students have the false belief that grades actually define who they are when, in, act when in fact they do not. It's not who they are. It's not uh, what they can be. So that's what we need to show them, that they have the potential to be whatever they want. Um, just they just have to find the right way for them and the right field for them and we need to guide them with what helps and uh what doesn't from our experience thank you thank you very much loredana i don't see other questions in the chat for the time being so i'll take just a second to mention also um, hamuk um that we would like to share with you um the course is called embracing language diversity in your classroom uh, is the 2021 uh, edition and i think uh, you you will find interesting as well the aim of the language aware teacher mooc is to enhance teacher awareness about the language competencies of their students and how to benefit from them as well as to provide them with different tools and resources to support them to deliver curricular subjects in different languages. So just to mention it as well, I think it uh, will be really interesting for most of the participants. Um, I see other positive comments in the chat, so I think everything you said was clear. And thank you very much again to you both, Loredana and Luana, for being uh, our guest speaker today. It was really a pleasure. 
and yes you will have uh, the link uh, of the of the project and all the material we share today you it we it will be available on the on the page of the webinar so you you will have everything there and now i would like to ask you oana loredana if you would like to add something to close the webinar the floor is yours you're muted okay. yeah <laughs> No, I mean, I already said it was a real pleasure to, to hear uh, to, to hear this project and I'm looking forward forward to to, um, to have it more more expanded and and uh, others to to um, how should I say to, to get ideas from it to. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to say because European language like uh, European language day is coming. Um, you have the European language community and you have lots of great examples of uh, teaching languages of projects that have been awarded and uh, a lot of things we can learn from them and don't um, like when I said Erasmus is going to get a lot more funding a lot more opportunities for your students to go and visit their retweeting uh, partners and to get a real experience a real life experience that they may not otherwise have we know we have students coming from disadvantaged um areas students that uh, could never afford to go to a different country and meet different students so if you have the possibility to go for erasmus accreditation or for erasmus um, short scale project um, that would really help your students and always find ways to bring specialists into your classrooms because even if you are, you could be their favorite teacher. It's a different thing when they have a specialist, when they have an astronaut coming to their class via Skype, when they have um, a physicist, when they have a biologist. It doesn't matter um, who that person really is. I mean, it doesn't have to be a Nobel Prize winner. Um, I know your our you know choices are limited, but um, it motivates students, and they will have to learn how to ask proper questions in English or in French or in German or in whatever language you want, but they will need to ask the questions using specific vocabulary. Again, something we need to teach more often. Thank you. Uh, I, um, I would like to read uh, just one second, one comment that I just saw in the chat, and I think it's a really nice comment from Carmen. I wish all colleagues an academic year with good health and tons of achievements. <laughs> so yes, indeed. Um, okay, nice comment. So thank you very much once again. Um, I would like to wish you all a good evening. And I hope to see you soon again for this Teacher Academy webinars. More news are coming, so stay tuned. Thank you very much, everyone.